Well, I uh, <clears throat> I do want to thank you all again, you know, for being here. It's uh, kind of like, you know, welcome. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, welcome all those that are watching us online, uh, you know, this morning. And I would like to invite you to come and to be a part of this place, this congregation. We are a group of people that love God and love one another. And as we, uh, you know, enter into this wonderful Father's Day, I, I kind of want to let y'all know a little bit more about Peggy and I because, you know, sometimes I get the feeling that y'all think that Peggy and I are, you know, camping novelists, uh, you know, but we're, we're not. We're camping uh, enthusiasts uh, that are very inexperienced. Uh, you know, we love to go out and camp, but we really don't know what we're doing. Uh, there's many times that we have, uh, you know, been out there camping and we would put, uh, you know, ground beef into a, uh, you know, into aluminum foil and put seasoning and stuff in there and then throw it into the fire and just let it sit in the coals and cook that way. Uh, you know, now the thing is, is that if you put cheese in the ground, in the ground meat, it's hard to get out of the aluminum foil. I know that by experience. Uh, you know, see, so we do a lot of things. Uh, you know, out in the wilderness, and yes, uh, you know, the first year that Peggy and I were here, uh, you know, we had Easter Sunday morning, we had the sunrise service, we had our regular service afterwards, and that, you know, that 11 o'clock, and we decided we were going to get on the motorcycle, and we were going to go camping that night, since we didn't have night service, so we went to Lake Watery State Park, uh, you know, nice, beautiful campground. Well, we're on the motorcycle, so the only camping gear that we have are hammocks. Cold front came through that night, and about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, it was about 30 degrees. Both of us were in our separate hammocks about to freeze to death, and she finally came over there and woke me up and said, Hey, can I get in there with you? <laughs> See, we're unexperienced. You know, we're, it's, it's not that we're all great at this, but we love to do it. Uh, you know, we have new experiences all the time. We went, we bought us one of those percolator coffee pots where you set it on the fire and it perks and makes your coffee. Well, we brought that along, but we didn't bring a coffee cup to drink the coffee that we made in the coffee pot. So we had to go to the store to get coffee, you know, to get a coffee cup so we could drink our coffee. By the time we got back from the store with the new coffee cup, the coffee had already you know, boiled out of the coffee pot. Now, that kind of tells you about what this is, okay? Now, see, Peggy and I, we also, whenever we lived in Mississippi, we, had, we lived in the side of a barn. So this lady had closed in part of the barn and made it a one-room apartment, one-bedroom apartment. But she had a nice patio on there, uh, you know. So we invited some friends over from church one evening, and it kind of got a little chilly. So we had our fire pit up on the patio. And we put some wood and stuff in there, and we had some vines. So we just went ahead and threw the vines on there. And, you know, we lit it up. Man, I tell you what, man, we had flames about four or five feet out of that, uh, you know, out of that, you know, that, um, you know, fire pit. Well, the problem with it is, is that it was underneath the patio. And all the friends and stuff was in. I'm like, John, you're about to burn your, you know, your apartment down. You know, we, we, we really got to move this. So us four guys, we grabbed it on each corner of it and we, you know, pulled it out into the, into the yard. And we had a Navy chaplain that was with us. And he reached up and he touched that roof and he goes, yeah, John. He said, it was almost to the point of combustion. Now, I don't know if any of y'all realize this, but you can get close enough to the fire and not be in the fire and it still be hot enough that you just burst into flames. Now, mm, okay, so I'm going to take this a different way because, see, in General Assembly, uh, you, know, to, you know, this week, last week that we, you know, Peg and I got to experience, the theme of it was Jesus is Lord. And you see it right there? Y'all were supposed to say amen whenever I say Jesus is Lord. <laughs> okay, y'all got y'all y'all get a hold to it. Uh, you know, but Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is the Lord of our life. And to add to the story about Phineas, Phineas Brzee, one of the reasons why he would always say good morning is because whenever he looked and thought process through the Church of the Nazarene, the sun was always on the horizon. Because there's always good things in the church of the Nazarene that's coming up. 
the sun's coming up. It's always good things. Uh, you know, so in our lives, there's always good things coming up because Jesus Christ is the Son of all. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Amen. 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 Oh, man. So now let's get back to the message about to the combustion. See, we're, we're all branches, right? So, you know, we, we look into the passage of Scripture, and there's a passage that, you know, God is the, uh, you know, is, is, the, is the gardener, and Jesus is the vine, and his father, the gardener, prunes all of the vines that do not produce fruit, right? And whenever he prunes them, he casts them off to the side, and they dry up, and then eventually he piles them all up, and he throws them into the fire to burn them up, and that, that's hell, that he throws them into. We're, we're all branches. Every single one of us are branches. Every single one of us, uh, you know, we live in this life and we have, uh, you know, we are branches. And, and unless we are producing, the Father is going to clip us off. He's going to prune it back. See, whenever we live and we walk in this world, in this life, the Holy Spirit is drawing each and every one of us to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, there's no way that we can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is drawing us unto Christ. And, and I, want to, I want to help you all to, to see and to grab a hold of this picture that we have with the Holy Spirit drawing us. See... Each and every one of us, as we receive Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come to a moment of what we would call crisis in our lives. There, it's a moment in our lives that we get to as the Holy Spirit is drawing us unto Christ that we realize that there's absolutely nothing that I can do from this point on on my own. I, I can't save myself I have tried to fix this problem. I have tried to get out of this addiction. I have tried to move forward in my life. I, I just can't do it. And then finally we get to that moment that we relinquish our control and we give it over to Jesus Christ. I, I want you to picture this because you are at the moment of combustion. Ooh. And do you not understand? Do you not picture this? We are at that moment in time in our lives that if we do not relinquish or if we do not call out to Christ, okay, that we can bust into flames. That our lives are no longer. Wherever you are, whoever you are, we must come to the end of our rope that it is absolutely nothing that I can do. Amen. Humanity in itself came to that point. And it came to that point because Jesus Christ came to this earth to provide salvation for each and every one of us. Amen. And he came at the right moment in time. The same way that he comes in the right moment in time in your life. Now, let's think about this. If Jesus Christ and, you know, and God is, is always on time, then the moment that Jesus Christ was born on this earth was the moment in time that it had to happen. And if it wouldn't have happened, humanity could have been too far to the other side and would have never been able to come back. You, you get this? That's the same way with our lives. We, we can get to the point that we are so far away from God and that we have ignored the call of the Holy Spirit that we can't come back. The moment of combustion. And whenever that moment happens, you and I, we don't know. We don't know when it happens. We don't know if it's whenever we draw our last breath. 
We don't know if at some point in time in our lives that we just simply get to the point and God says, you know, I have given you every opportunity to come back to me. I have called you. I have been evident in your life. I have been this prevenient grace. My grace has been guiding you, has been protecting you, and has been with you and calling you up until this moment in time. But you have refused the call. And that call will not be given anymore. Peggy's grandfather, uh, you know, I can, I can imagine that he was a great man. I have listened to many of his sermons that they recorded. He has a couple of sermons that they, writ, that they wrote and put into a book. And one of them is called, uh, you know, The Unpardonable Sin. And in that book and in that message of the unpardonable sin, he remembers this lady that was in a revival, a tent revival, And she felt the call of the Holy Spirit on her life, but she refused because she wanted to go out dancing that night. So she didn't come down to the altar and receive Jesus Christ as her Savior because she wanted to go dancing. And she said, if I'm saved, then God wouldn't want me to go dancing. So she decided to go dancing. About two or three years later, he's standing with her in the hospital as she's on her deathbed. And he is praying for her. And he is asking her to ask God into her heart. And she says, I don't feel it anymore. I can't feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit in my life. And she said, I can't say yes because I can't feel it. Are you going to take that chance that it might be you that as you have received and as you have heard and felt the calling of Christ on your life that you're going to continue to reject him and one day you're going to come to him and say, God, please come into my heart and his Holy Spirit is not there any longer. Are you going to chance that? Because of the combustion... You're close enough, right? And that's the problem with us Christians and and Christians and the lost people in the world. We want to see how close we can get to sin without falling into it. Instead of seeing how close we can get to God and staying away from it. I was out with a group of our friends and stuff last night. And we got off the boat and I told them, I said, you know, I said, you know, we got to hang out with good people. Whenever we hang out with good people, then it's easier for us to make good decisions. Whenever we hang out with the wrong people, we hang out with bad people, it's hard to make the right decision. Because whenever they want to continue walking this way, and God's telling you that you really now need to walk this way, you still want to walk this way with them. Are we going to be at that moment of combustion that we're going to turn and walk towards God or we're going to continue being right there by the fire and just simply burst into flames? And I hope you understand that the flames that I'm talking about is that we're going to step over into uh, you into hell. I want you to see this. And I've got to slow down because I need for you to really to picture this because I've preached on this passage of scripture. And whenever I read this in this passage of scripture, I mean, it jumped out to me. And then as I sat there during, you know, during general assembly and just about every message that they gave, I kept going back to this passage of scripture. So I want to take you back to Zechariah chapter three, verses one through five. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 and and here we go we've got this here and it says then he showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him now we've already talked about the accuser the accusing and the accuser but that's not what I want to talk about today It says, it goes in verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick or a, a burning stick snatched from fire? 
I want you to grab a hold of this. It's this burning stick that Jesus Christ snatches from the fire before it is consumed by hell's fire. You get this? Jesus Christ is telling Satan, your rebuke, I understand it. Yes, he is a sinner, but he believes in me as his Lord and Savior, and I'm going to snatch him away from the fire before you can consume him. You get it? And he does that for each and every one of us. As we believe in Jesus Christ, he snatches us from fire. We don't know if that moment that we received Jesus Christ, if we would have denied him at that moment, that it would have been the last opportunity that we had to receive him as our Lord and Savior. We don't know that, but we need to turn to him because if not, we will be consumed by the hellfire. We have that opportunity to return to Him or to turn to Him. I want you to see this. Jesus Christ is standing there. Satan is right next to Joshua, the high priest. Jesus doesn't say, no, he is not sinful. He is not a sinful man, but I am his Lord. And because I am Jesus Christ, I will take him from where he is and I will clean him up, right? You go on into the scripture and stuff. And what does it say in verse three? Now, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. That's the sin as he stood before the angel so the lord uh, you know so the angel of the lord spoke to those standing before him take off the filthy clothes then he said to him see i have removed your iniquities i have removed your sins from you and i will clothe you with festive clothes or robe he clothes us clothes us with him with his righteousness. Amen. Because we believe in him. Oh man. So we have that. We have that picture of our Lord and Savior standing there and snatching us away before we're consumed by the fire. Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 3. Peggy took me to this one here. I remember week before last, she talked about digging the ditches. Well, here you go. 2 Kings chapter 3. This here is all about the kings and you have have these three kings. I'm not going to try to pronounce them all. You've got these three kings. And they come together. So you have the kingdom of, of Jerusalem. Or you have the king of, of Jerusalem. And you have the king of the northern tribes of Judah. And you have those two kings. And the, kings, uh, and the king of Edom come together against the king of the Moabites. And the king of the Moabites, they were going against him. Because he was supposed to be given wool and rams to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to the king of, of Jerusalem. But he had stopped because his father had passed away. So he stopped doing that. So they were going to war against them. They all three come together and they say, okay, how are we going to go? What route are we going to take to get to the Moabites? And it says, we're going to take the roundabout route. Now, it was most probably a route that, uh, you know, that was kind of, it had a direction to get there. It's not like us saying that, well, you know, I'm just going to go a roundabout. I'm just going to wander around. I don't think they were just wandering around in this valley hoping that they get to the place. They were going to a specific place because they were going to battle the king of the, uh, you know, or the Moabites. So we find that they were wandering around for seven days and they ran out of water. They didn't have any water. They didn't have any water for the men. Didn't have any water for the cattle, for the animals. I don't know why they brought cattle. Unless they were going to kill them for the food. Uh, you know, but they brought all the animals and stuff. They had animals with them. Uh, you know, and they had, they didn't have, nobody had water. Seven days that they were going around and didn't have any water. So what do they do? Well, number one, they begin to worry. And they begin to, you know, to wonder about, you know, did we come out into this desert, into this wilderness uh, you know, so that we could die here? Or so that we could be so weak and the Moabites come and destroy us? 
And then they begin to search out for God and for one of God's men. And Elijah was there. Elisha was there. So they went and they got him. And I want you to kind of picture this. And I'm sorry I can't pronounce these kings' names. But we have the king that was in there. One of the kings uh, you know, that was there. His mother and father was the ones that Elijah was, uh, you know, was there. And they had all of the priests and they had the, the, uh, the altar that they made. And they were cutting themselves and hollering and screaming, uh, you know, trying to get their God to consume the fire. Uh, you know, and then Elijah calls down. And, okay, so this is his mother and father. Okay, so Elisha comes and he says, you know what? He says, I'm not going to say anything to you. I don't have any respect of you. Because you're not a godly man. So why in the world are you calling out to God? Now, now to me, that's a question that we all should answer. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of people that call out to God in their times of trouble. But if he's not your God, why are you going to call out to him? If you're not really following him, if you're not obeying his commands, why in the world are you going to pray to him and expect him to bless you? Right? We do that. We, you know, we're, we are not obedient to God and we cause a problem in our lives. And the first thing we do is we call out to him. And because of his grace and his mercy, he protects us, right? But we expect God to bless us whenever we don't do what God asks us to do. So we see this, we've got this, and these people, they come to him. Okay, and uh, you know, he says this to, you know, to this one king, but he says, out of respect to uh, you know, the king of Jerusalem, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this. And he asked for them to get someone that plays music. Uh, you know, give me the harp or send somebody that plays the harp. Now, to me, this kind of shows that, you know, there's a lot to do with the worship of God through music. There, there's a reason why we start off our service, uh, you know, and we praise and worship God through song. Number one, it's, it kind of gets rid of all the things of the world. And, and we spend this time that we sing songs and begin to concentrate on God. And it softens our soul that we can receive the seed from God's word that we have. But see, God inhabits his praise. As we praise him, he's there. And, and that's what we find here, because once he started worshiping God through the music, it says that God then spoke to him. Now, I want you to go in, and we're, we're all the way down. I've walked you all the way through to verse 16. And here's where we're going to kind of stick at here for a little bit. In verse 16, it says, this is the message uh, you know, that he gave, that the Lord gave to him at the end of verse 15. And he says, then he says... This is what the Lord says. Dig ditch after ditch in this, in this, it would be valley, but in the, uh, you know, in the translation that we have here, it would be yade, uh, which means valley. Uh, you know, so he's telling them to dig ditch after ditch. Because he is going to bring water to them. You remember this? It goes on. It says that he's going to bring water. But he's not going to bring it in the original way. That's why it says that you won't see any wind. And you won't see the rain. But, you, but the yade will be filled with water. And you will drink and your cattle and your animals. This is easy in the Lord's sight. He will also hand Moab over to you. I, I want you to see and I want you to kind of grab a hold to this. I've tried to paint this picture that number one, that we in receiving and hearing and listening to the Holy Spirit, that we have been snatched away from Satan and that we are in the hands and the clutches of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that there's nothing that can remove you from my hands. But it doesn't mean that I can't remove myself from your hands. But it does mean that Satan can't come and get you. 
Okay, so we have that security. We've also talked in the, you know, our uh, you know, series through one on how we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He protects us from the war, from the spiritual warfare that Satan is in. So we are protected, but we can still leave that protection. But we have to step into it to begin with. We have to receive him as our Lord and Savior to begin with. The blessings that he wants to pour out upon us. The blessings that he wants to give us. Is all determined by the depth of the ditches we are willing to dig. And how many ditches are we willing to dig? Now let me give you into this ditches. Okay. Because there comes a point in time. And Paul tells us that we as believers need to stop drinking milk and begin to eat the meat of God. There has to come a point in time in our lives and throughout our lives that we constantly grow deeper in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. If we are only shallow in our understanding, in our depth, in our belief of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we're only going to be able to handle a small blessing. Because that's all we can see. It's whenever we allow ourselves to dig down deep and to truly know who God is and to know what God has for us and to understand that we need to walk in that pathway is whenever he's going to be able to give us the really deep and great blessings. The blessings that go beyond our comprehension. The blessings that are so great that we can't picture them. We can't fathom them. We don't even understand them. But as long as we're on the surface, our blessings will be on the surface. That's either an oh my or praise the Lord. It just depends on where you're at in your walk with Christ. He says, dig ditch after ditch. Now, what do you think would have happened if they would have only dug one ditch about two or three feet long? Because they were too tired and too thirsty. I think they would have perished. Because how did God defeat them? How did they defeat them with God's help? Keep on reading, because whenever you keep on reading, what happens is, is that in the morning, whenever the sun comes up, the Moabites come up to the ridge and they begin to look down into that valley. And the sun begins to shine off and to glitter off of the water that's down in that valley. Oh, by the way, it, it flows from Edom. It didn't rain. It just simply flowed from Edom. And filled all of those ditches in that valley. And whenever the sun shined upon that, it looked like blood. So the Moabites look down there and they see all this red. And they're like, oh my goodness, these three kings came out here to fight and to defeat us. And they got mad at each other and they just killed each other. So now let's go down there and just simply pick up all the spoils. And they went down there to three fresh armies because they had just had a good drink of water. And they were slaughtered. They chased them back to their cities. It even goes as far as saying that they actually cut down the good wood. So they didn't have any wood. They, they didn't have any trees or anything in the land. And even the good land where they were able to grow crops and stuff, they took and threw rocks and stuff in there. So they couldn't grow crops in it. How deep are your ditches? How deep are you willing to go with Jesus Christ to receive the blessings that he has for you? <laughs> I'm going to pause for a moment and let y'all think about that. Because see, this message as it pertains individually 
this message pertains to Rock Hill First Church of the Nazarene. How deep are we going to allow God to bless us? How, how, how much of a blessing are we going to receive from God? It determines, it's going to be determined on by how willing we are to go deep with Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you, I can tell you things are going to get bad. They're going to get a whole lot worse than what we think now. Are we going to be deep enough in Christ that we're going to be able to receive the blessings whenever it's all, whenever all this comes in and comes about? You know, New York City, in the last two or three weeks, maybe, maybe a month, they started putting vending machines out in the city. What do these vending machines hold? They hold pot pipes, drug paraphernalia, gloves, syringes, and it's all free. Because they want the drug addicts to be able to have the ability to get the drugs whenever they need it. And they want to provide a way for them to be able to get it. Now that makes sense, right? It, it makes sense that we know that drugs kill, so we're going to make it readily available to somebody so that they can kill themselves. It, it makes sense for that to happen. I, I, I'm confused. I, I think back to whenever they first put seatbelts in cars and, and they made it a law that you had to ride it, wear a seatbelt. How many people were in an uproar because, oh, they're not going to make me wear a seatbelt. There's still some people today that still don't wear seatbelts. I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. But what happened? They did a study and they said that seat belts will protect you in a car wreck. We think this is the best thing for you. We want to save you. Studies have shown that, uh, you know, that drugs, that, you know, that cocaine, uh, you know, it kills you. You can get addicted and by the addiction it takes everything away from you. We're smart enough to know that, but we're just going to give you whatever you want. That's like telling your kid, uh, you know, as you're cooking, the, you know, cooking something. I'll go ahead and touch the stove. I know you're going to do it anyway. It's hot. And I know, what, I know what's best for you, but I'm not going to say anything because you're going to experience it yourself. Go ahead. Touch it. Let me help you. And I know it's going to burn you, but let me help you. Right? I'm going to set you up right here next to it. It doesn't make sense to us, but it makes sense to a lot of people in government that that's what they're going to do. It doesn't make sense to us a lot of things that the, that the world around us is doing, right? Doesn't make any sense. It's not our responsibility to make sense of it. Our responsibility is to love the ones that the Holy Spirit's drawing and calling. And what's the Holy Spirit drawing them and calling them to or from? He's calling them from the fire. But He's calling them to salvation. To believing and receiving in Jesus Christ. He's not calling them to release their drugs. He's not calling them to, uh, you know, to all this stuff here. He just simply wants them and needs them, them to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And once they acknowledge that, the Holy Spirit then begins to work and convict them of their sins. But the first thing that they have to do is recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. We want them to get all fixed up, don't we? 
Man, you got to stop drinking. You got you got to stop all those drugs. You you got to stop sleeping around. You got to stop doing this. You got We want him to get all fixed up. What we should want him to do is realize that Jesus Christ is Lord. And whenever they realize that Jesus Christ is Lord, then their life is changed. It's not by what we do, it's by what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will meet you where you are, but He loves you so much, He won't leave you there. He will transform your life into a loving and believing life. Once you receive Him, you cannot and you will not be the same as before. Because of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So I pose the question again. How deep are we going to go? How deep is Rock Hill First Church of the Nazarene going to dig to allow God to bless us? You know, I'll, I'll be, I'm going to go all the way back to before I even interviewed at this church. Over seven years ago, I looked into all the records and stuff of, of this church. And I was all excited, man. I, you know, I looked in there and, uh, you know, there was, there was a point in time in the history of this church that they averaged somewhere around 50 to 60 kids. Now, I get here, and I understand that those were kids that came in on a bus, the Jesus bus. And I also understand that one of the reasons on why they're no longer coming here was because we didn't have the opportunity to discipline them, and they just simply kind of ran amok within the church. How many of you right now would say, I'd love to have 50 kids running amok in this church? See, how deep are we willing to go? Are we willing to sacrifice our comfort so that other people can receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Are we willing to sacrifice the things that make us feel good whenever we come here on Sunday mornings so that someone else from this lost world can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Are we willing to do that? We have people that surround us that are addicted to drugs, that are addicted to alcohol. Are we willing to sacrifice an evening of our time to come and to help them through that addiction? Because there's a lot of times that we say yes, but we really don't mean it. The evidence, the evidence comes in the digging. The evidence comes whenever we're actually willing to get out and to get dirty. Amen. How obedient are we going to be? At what point in time are we going to stop drinking milk and really begin to eat the meat that Jesus Christ has for us? There's, there's no halfway. There's no lukewarmness. I, I hope you understand that, you know, it's, you know, it's westernized. It's, it's us that has created this lukewarmness. Because he says, you're either hot or you're cold. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. In other words, if you're lukewarm, you have, I have nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing to do with you. You are either on fire for me or you're cold for me. Oh, now, wait a minute. We got cold because, see, there's good and cold, right? Whenever you twist your ankle, you'll understand about the cold and how that cold helps the swelling. Some of us need to be cold. And I'm not talking about cold in Christ. I'm talking about we need to be the ones that help people to heal. And there's some of us that need to be hot and need to be passionate, and need to be moving, and need to be evangelizing, and need to be walking the streets, and need to be calling the people, and getting them back into the house of God. How 
How deep? How deep are you going to go? You know, we have community groups, and I am going to close in this one here. It's not going to be like I closed last time. Our community group, uh, you know, we, three weeks ago, just all of a sudden something happened, and, and you know, uh, Peggy was leading us in a Bible study, and her and a couple of people had the, uh, you know, the Bible app, and they had shared this Bible study with each other. And all of a sudden, everybody in that community group began to download that app and began to share Bible studies with one another. And now we're connected through that app, as in they see the things that we highlight. They see the Bible studies that we, that we go in. We're all growing deep with Christ as we grow together in Christ. Maybe, to, maybe that means more to me than it does to you. Because there's a gentleman that asked me yesterday to be a friend of his. He has not been in this church. But he's a part of that app. See, we've got to begin to do these things that are out of the norm. Because there's hurting people that's out there that just need our love. They don't need us to take the Bible and beat them over the head with it. They just need our love. But if we're not able to dig deep enough, we'll never get there. We'll never be able to get there. I told you I was going to close with that, so I'm closing. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, God, for these words. God, I thank you, dear Lord, for what you have shown us here. God, I pray that individually, God, that individually each person here would begin to dig ditches in their lives, waiting for you to fill them up with your blessings. Fill them up to where they overflow, that your blessings begin to pour out of us and onto the people that's around us. God, I pray that you would be with Rock Hill and that you would continue to help us to grow deeper, dear Lord, that we would dig ditches, ditches. God, that you would fill those ditches and that you would begin to bless this church. And God, that we would move outside, dear Lord, and that we would begin to affect the people that's around us. But God, that we would begin to actually minister to the ones that are here. God, to the ones that are in this church that has addictions, God, that we would begin to help them through those addictions. God, the ones that are struggling with specific sins, that we would come alongside of them and help them to walk through those things. God, because you are deep in our hearts and in our lives that you reveal these things to us. And God, that we would be obedient to what you would have for us to do. God, bless us and bless this church. In Jesus' name, amen.